Hello Year 8 and welcome to your Geography catch-up lesson. If you're reading this, it might mean that we haven't received much work from you yet. And we really do understand that this can be a really difficult and challenging time for you to complete work at home. What we would really like you to do is complete the four tasks on this lesson in order to help you catch up with the rest of your classmates. If you complete these four lessons, we will be happy that you are at a good place and have the knowledge and understanding you need in order to move forward with the next lessons. We have picked out the four main tasks, the four most important tasks from the last few weeks of lessons. So hopefully, if you listen to the explanations on each slide, you'll be able to complete these to the best of your ability. Once you've completed the four tasks, you can do this on a Word document, on PowerPoint, or on paper, please make sure you do submit this to your class teacher by the end of the week. So to start, what we would like you to do is read the information um, on the slide. So underneath where it says our numbers are growing fast. And I'd like you to try and complete the sentences in the grey box in your own words. So it says people appeared on Earth about and you need to try and use the information on the slide to figure out when people first started to appear on earth and then also how those populations increased over time so hopefully you can see that today there are over 7 billion people living on earth and obviously that is still set to rise but we're going to start thinking about well, when did the population grow so much and why did it grow and you can see there it says, how does the population rise so fast? And there's a little example here of Bo and Ella. OK, so Bo and Ella in 1744 got married and had four children. All of those children had children of their own. So those four children had a further 18 children between them. 16 of the 18 children had their own children and that made 76. So what you can see is that just from two people, OK, from 1750 to 1820, there was a huge increase in numbers of that family. So the bottom part, OK, doesn't sound very pleasant, but it says, but what about the, the deaths? Every year, millions of humans die, unfortunately, but the population still keeps rising. So this must mean that more babies are being born. So the birth rate is higher than the death rate. So more children, more babies are being born every year than people are dying, which must mean that the population grows year on year. Now, the extension there says, is the growing population of the world a good thing? So there are arguments for both increasing populations and also um, there's arguments against it. So I'd like you to have a think and I'd like you to explain your opinion in your own words. OK, as in geography, we always like to look at data. We like to look at graphs. And this is a really important graph. And it's probably one you'll see a lot over the next few years of geography lessons. So this graph shows world population. OK, so you can look through from A to I. You can read each of these boxes and start thinking about what this is showing. So along the X axis, OK, which is along the bottom, it's showing the year. So it goes back to 10,000 BC and up the Y axis, it's showing the world population in billions. OK, so on the left hand side here, it shows the world population in billions. And here it gives some specific dates of when world population increased by a billion. OK, so we can see that one billion people were living on Earth in 1804, and that increased to 2 billion in 1927. And as we go up, we can see that actually increases much quicker. There's much more rapid population increase after the Industrial Revolution. And especially if we look, it went from 5 billion um, to 6 billion, OK, from 1987 to 1999. OK, so that is obviously only 12 years it took to increase by a billion. So that's a huge, huge jump. Um, and it's something that we is really important to us as geographers, as it can lead to different types of impacts. So when we're looking at graphs, we need to think about what's the general trend. Well, the general trend here is that there's been an increase. 
OK, so there has been an increase in population. That's very, very easy to see. But if we're looking at specific patterns, we can see that really there was no increase in population. There's a very, very little increase um, until around the Industrial Revolution. So started maybe the Roman times, um, about 43 AD, started to increase a little bit. So that's G. And then the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution started in the United Kingdom around 1750. OK, 1760. So that is when population really started to grow. And then world population has continued to grow. And there was an even um, more recent population explosion around the 1950s too. So what I would like you to do is study the graph and write four sentences to describe the shape of this graph. Now, you can give a general pattern. OK, so general pattern. You can then try and also give some data. So, for example, in 10,000 BC, there were just, you know, very, very few people. There were three million people living on Earth. OK, so use the information on the slide to try and give some data, but also give some of the general patterns that happened. You can also try and give some odd ones out. We like to give an anomaly as well, as you know. Um, so you can always try and find something that doesn't quite fit the pattern. All right. So maybe the rapid increase around 1760 didn't quite fit the general pattern before. So write four sentences about this graph. And then your extension is to say how many years, work out how many years it took to go from 1 billion to 2 billion. So we know that it went from 1804, 1 billion, and then 2 billion in 1927. So can you work out how many years were between 1804 and 1927? And then how many years did it take to go from 3 billion to 6 billion? OK, so hopefully you'll see that population has started to increase much more rapidly in more recent times. OK, so your second main task is to read the information on the slide here. So the information says our impact on Earth. We think we are the cleverest species on Earth. We make use of its resources in all kinds of ways, but it's not all good news. And then it goes on and it talks about the fact that we are obviously taking over land that is there for other living things too. So we think that over 100,000 species a year are dying out now and even pandas are at risk. Obviously, the more resources we use, the more waste we create. And it says here it gets dumped on land and at sea. Some rots away quite fast, but some will hang around for centuries. And then the last one is what I was just talking about on the previous slide. We cause other pollution too, like acid rain, which kills trees. And scientists say we're helping to bring on global warming by burning fuels. Well, we know that from our previous unit. So what I'd like you to do is think about if the human population were to double in the next 50 years. So that is quite a uh, crazy thing to think, OK? So that would mean that we would have over 14 billion people living on this planet. What problems do you think that might cause for humans and for animals? And I'd like you to write a small paragraph on that based on everything on this slide. And the extension on this slide is really important too. I'd like you to think about solutions to population growth. What is the solution and is there no hope? So the last part of the book here says there is hope. We now see that we must live in a more sustainable way, which does not harm us or other species and is not wasteful. We are trying to repair some of the damage we've done. Our population is not likely to keep growing. Some experts predict that it will rise to around 9 billion by 2050, then fall. So this is really important. There is still hope. And it will be about how we change the ways in which we live. And we've talked a lot about that in the age of stupid. So think about some of the solutions to this problem. So I'll come back to those two key terms again in a moment. But this is going to help us understand the difference between developing and developed countries in the world. 
This is a line, okay, that runs through the world and it isn't the equator. As you can see, the equator would be further south and also a straight line. It does look like it's going through the middle of the Earth and I want you to think about what this line is representing. So above the line, you've got countries like Canada and the USA and the UK. And below the line, you've got places like Kenya and India, Namibia, Argentina and Peru. In fact, pretty much all of Africa is below, the continent of Africa is below this line. And this line was actually invented by somebody called Mr. Brandt. It's called the Brandt Line. And it was designed in order to separate countries by their level of development. So just think to yourself now, where do you think the developed countries on Earth are? Do you think they fall above the Brandt Line or below? So hopefully you have realised that the developed countries on Earth tend to fall above the Brandt line. And as you can see, Australia it kind of does a big squiggle round Australia and New Zealand because they are also developed, but obviously in the southern hemisphere. So the general trend here is that our developed countries, our richer countries, tend to be in the northern hemisphere. We're going to start thinking about why that is throughout this lesson. Finally, I would like you to complete some extended writing. So I'd like you to think for about 10 minutes um, and write for about 10 minutes answering this question. Why are developing countries so poor? There's lots of examples here on the board, pictures that might help you. I would like you to think, OK, so why in the world when we have so many countries that are so wealthy, why are there still some that are so poor? And here are some reasons. Some of those reasons are natural reasons, they're physical reasons. It might be that countries experience climatic hazards, things like flooding or drought. That means that they struggle to get the food that they need and therefore they struggle to develop at the same speed as other countries. It might be that people in certain places in the world don't have access to safe drinking water. This can make them really unwell. It can also mean that people have to travel a long way to get water and as a result those people aren't working and making money or aren't going to school and getting an education. There's also things like malaria in some countries. This can kill lots and lots of children every day. Okay, There's something on the, on the screen here that says malaria kills 3,000 children every single day. If that is something that's happening within your within a country that is really going to impact the speed of development of that country so have a look at some of these pictures okay and think about okay so why are some countries still so poor and if you need examples you can look at you can look back to the brant line and look at any of those countries that are below the brant line but also there are other countries that we'll look at in geography anyway throughout the next few years such as haiti Uganda and Peru. So think about why some countries, why developing countries are still so poor and try and write maybe three or four reasons in your answer. So just to summarise the four tasks that we would like you to submit to your class teacher by the end of this week. Here they are again. You have task one, which was to complete the sentence starters. Um, task two, which was to study the line graph and describe it. Task three was to answer the question, what problems do you think um, will be caused for humans and animals if the population doubles in the next 50 years? And task four is your extended writing about why developing countries are still so poor. If you have any questions, please email your class teacher and they'll be able to help you out more directly.